thanks so much for having us. My name is Penny Milton. I'm here with Matt Weatherly, and we're going to talk about your water today. So here's who we are. Uh, I'm mostly going to focus on saving water and talking about how to uh, save money on your bill. Matt's going to be talking about water quality and lead, and we'll all we'll together kind of be talking about our system and how it works. But before we do that, we're gonna launch a quick poll here. We'd like to know where you live, where you're coming from today. So that'll help us kind of tailor our presentation. So I'll have Wayne bring that up. Okay, and you can show results whenever you feel like it's ready. So we have a split. We have some people in Portland, some people outside of Portland, and so I'm going to try to address both, although I don't know where you are if you're outside of Portland, so you're welcome to put that in the chat and that will help us too. Um, I did want to mention before I start, if there's any accommodations needed, anything, I'm, I am going to try to describe slides for anyone who may be on the phone or not be able to see the slides, but if there's anything else you need and we can do in the moment, please put that into the chat, that'd be super helpful. All right, what I hope you come away with today is a better understanding of our water system, how that water gets to you, and we're going to talk then about water quality and tips for managing water quality at home. We're going to look at some bills, do troubleshooting of leaks, and then high bills, how you might address high bills. And then if you know someone who has lost income uh, recently, we have programs that can help. So we'd love for you to come away with that information so that you know uh, how we can uh, assist you in this time. We've got another poll for you here. So do you drink tap water? We'll just put that out there and go ahead and respond when you're ready. If you're on Facebook, you can comment as well. That'd be helpful. Few more seconds. Okay, and we can show the results. Okay, I, uh, there we go. So I think most of our attendees, at least on Zoom, um, are drinking tap water. So that's kind of fun. Sometimes it's a mix, but um, our tap water is really delicious here. And we're going to talk about how that delicious water gets to you. So happy to hear that you're already drinking it. So where does our water come from? Our water comes from two primary or two sources. We have our primary drinking water source, which is the Bull Run watershed. We have our second drinking water source, which is a groundwater source. It's the Columbia South Shore well field, and that's located out by the air, airport along I-84. So we're going to take sort of a virtual tour and we'll start up in the watershed and move into town. We'll show where they come together and where our drinking water, or excuse me, where our groundwater mixes and then how it gets distributed out into the system. So this is a map of our drinking water system. It just is a stylized version of um, where our water comes from and how it gets distributed. We're gonna start up in the watershed and here I'll use my pointer to show you. So if you're looking at the slide, it's the area that's being circled and then we'll head into town, meet at Powell Butte and we'll talk about our groundwater system as well. But before we do that, what is a watershed, right? I've been saying this word watershed. Um, a watershed is basically an area of land where all of that water that falls on that land com it falls and drains to a common point. So in this case, there is a lake or a river here, and that is the common point where all of this rain and snow are draining to. So in our watershed, the common point is the Bull Run River. And I'm gonna Go to the next slide so you can see an aerial of our watershed. So our watershed is inside of this boundary that you can see. So there is a, a line that I'm drawing that's kind of like a big triangle shape. This is our protection area actually around the watershed. But within this is the drainage where if snow or rain falls on this land, it's going to drain to the common point, which is that Bull Run River. And that's what we drink here in the city of Portland. That's our primary drinking water source. It's located near Mount Hood out, um, outside of the town of Sandy, Oregon, but it's actually not connected to Mount Hood as far as that drainage. So that's a good thing. And we'll talk more about that in a second, but it is separated by a ridge here and the water from Mount Hood flows into different rivers, like for example, the Sandy River. 
And the Sandy River is called the Sandy River because it has lots of grit and stuff in it that you wouldn't want to drink. So we're really uh, grateful that we have that boundary and we have this really um, pristine and uh, low turbidity drink drinking water source. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Out in the other circled area, this little area is the Columbia South Shore well field. So that's our groundwater source. It's in the city of Portland out by the airport. So I just mentioned that word turbidity and turbidity is basically the amount of stuff that's floating around in our water. And that's what this picture is. So these kids are checking for turbidity levels in water. They're doing a water quality test. And we wanna make sure that we have very low turbidity um, so that things can't grow on the stuff that's floating in water. And we do in the bull run because the rocks in our watershed are very hard and resistant to erosion. They're Columbia River basalt rocks. So that's a, an advantage of where our watershed is located. And this is your drinking water. So this is a stream in the watershed. Obviously it's not treated yet, so you couldn't just stick a water bottle in, but this is basically, you know, your water before it gets to you in the pipes. And now we're gonna take that virtual journey. So we'll head up to Bull Run Lake and then down the river from there. So this is a picture of Bull Run Lake. It is a natural lake with a man-made, human-made dam that allows us to store additional water in the lake. And then from there, uh, water travels to the, or into the Bull Run River. So this is Bull Run River before it gets to our first dam. Moving down, this is our first dam, Dam 1. So in the background, there is this little structure. This is actually a huge dam. We're just looking at the back side of it. And this is during a time of drawing down the water. Um, so you can see the banks are exposed here a little bit. So these reservoirs are made to be drawn down during those summer months, and then they refill in the winter. So the reason why we have dams in the watershed is because of our hot, dry summers where it doesn't rain for basically three months and our water use doubles in the city. So we need to have that storage. We'll keep going here. This is a historic picture of the dam. I just think it's really cool. And then we'll show you, a, this was built in the 1920s, finished in 1929, and it's still um, in use today. So this is a more recent picture of the dam. So water travels from the top here, either over or through the dam, and then down to our second reservoir, which is this, Reservoir 2. So in both dams, we have the ability to pull water from different depths. And what you're seeing here are two towers. So there is a larger tower and a smaller tower, but both pull allow us to basically, if you imagine a straw with different holes throughout that straw, they can pull from different levels. That's what this is allowing us to do. So we can pull that really cold water and for example, send it downstream for fish because they need that really cold water. So that's an advantage of how our uh, dams are constructed. And now, so I'll show you where we were. So we started up at Bull Run Lake. We went into the Bull Run Watershed, uh, excuse me, uh, Reservoir 1 and Dam 1 and Reservoir 2, Dam 2. Our water gets treated and Matt's gonna talk more about that, but now it's heading into pipes and it's going into, uh, into town. So we're gonna switch over to our second source, which is that groundwater source out by the airport. So we have, uh, groundwater is within aquifers out by the airport and these wells are different varying depths. I think the deepest is about 600 feet, but we're basically pulling from 26 drinking water wells and then uh, treating that water and mixing it with bull run water and then it goes out into our distribution system. This is our groundwater storage tank. And then we monitor for water quality throughout the well field as well. And this is one of our staff members at our monitoring wells and just doing some testing there. If you're ever driving along a Marine Drive, <clears throat> excuse me, you might see these bunker like structures and this is actually uh, where the wells are located. So right underneath this is our well and then, or excuse me, our pumps and then below that is the well itself. And then up at Powell Butte, you'll, you may have visited this visitor center and hiked some of the trails, but below that are two large storage tanks 
And uh, that is basically the hub of our system before it's, it heads out into smaller pipes and out to your neighborhoods. Okay, so we were here and now we're heading out into the various neighborhoods. So you might recognize things like this. These are storage tanks that might be located right next to your home, for example. Uh, they allow us to regulate pressure throughout the system and also have addi additional storage throughout the system. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Matt and he's gonna kind of talk through how we keep water safe along the way and how that water is treated. But before I do that, are there any questions on that part? Wing, I'll let you let me know if there are. If any, I don't, uh, we don't have any questions at this time. Okay, great. So if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put those into the chat and then we will have time at the end too. All right, Matt, take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Penny. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been working with the Portland Water Bureau for over 13 years. The last four years, um, I've been working to promote lead and water testing and prevention, um, as well as co-managing our water quality phone line and email. So that means I get to talk to customers like yourselves and try to troubleshoot water quality and, and pressure issues. Um, and just generally speaking, as your water provider, you know, public health and delivery of safe drinking water, those are our main priorities. Um, so there's many different ways to enjoy your drinking water. Um, we know you have your, all of your favorites, um, but you may not know how we deliver that safe drinking water. So I'm just going to take you behind the scenes in that process. Um, but before I do that, I just want to give a quick um, poll to see how many um, of you um, understand whether we are a filtered water system or, or not. So I'll just give you um, just a few seconds to, to put in your answers for that. All right, it looks like it's pretty well split between um, those that think we're uh, filtered and those that think we're not. So we're actually an unfiltered system, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't treat the water. Um, and we will be doing some future filtration, which I'll just share a little bit about um, a little bit. So our recipe for delivering safe drinking water is really managing it from the source to the tap. And that starts with monitoring. So as Penny mentioned, our watershed has restricted public access. And as you, with, you can see with that aerial shot, it's very well um, wooded and protected. And there is, so there is no development or industry or any logging uh, up in our watershed, which really uh, provides a, uh, a great recipe for um, safe drinking water. So we really, we look at it as a monitoring treatment and maintenance of our system. And when it comes to monitoring um, within our watershed, um, you know, we're evaluating stream flows, wildlife activity, and many other water quality parameters to check for current and then long-term trends. That helps us just study and make adjustments to our water um, quality before treatment. Then our next step is, is actual treatment. We have minimal treatment. So we had a small amount of chlorine and then an even smaller amount of ammonia which combine to make a chloramine and that just provides a longer lasting treatment. And then third, we add a small amount of sodium hydroxide, which basically just changes the pH of the water to help protect indoor plumbing. And then a common question that we receive is whether we're fluoridated or if we add fluoride to our drinking water and we do not. As I mentioned, we are gonna have some future treatment coming up, uh, some changes. Improved corrosion control is happening in just a little over a year where we'll be adjusting the pH a little bit more as well as the alkalinity of the water, which we've never done before. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more uh, later in the presentation as it relates to um, lead uh, in drinking water. And then in 2027, we'll actually be installing an actual filtration plant because uh, currently we do not have one. And you can learn more about that from our website or um, other presentations, public presentations that we provide. So the next step in delivering safe drinking water is sampling. So after treatment, we can't just walk away and say, oh, we're good, you know, things are fine. We actually have over 2,200 uh, miles of our distribution system. So we've set up about 95 strategically located monitoring stations. So um, as this uh, image shows, one of our certified samplers is checking our, basically our system vitals, like if you go to the doctor and checking your blood pressure and that kind of thing. This allows us again to kind of gauge the effectiveness of our treatment and really make adjustments as necessary. Um, 
And we then uh, do a lot of laboratory analysis. So we, our staff bring about 11,000 samples um, to our uh, a lab for analysis and our lab techs conduct about 49, 50,000 um, tests a year. And all those regulatory tests are validated by our lab and then reported to the Oregon Health Authority, which is the regulatory body, um, on a monthly basis. And as you can tell, even before COVID, our lab tests were wearing masks for when they're doing any kind of bacterial analysis. That's just to prevent any kind of cross-contamination. But even with COVID, any of our staff, including myself entering, um, we take extra precautions um, because we, we know that we have to continue to deliver safe drinking water for yourselves, hospitals, coffee shops, fire response, you name it. Um, and then, you know, our delivery of safe drinking water really wouldn't also be possible without system maintenance. Um, and just to sort of briefly overcap, you know, we have the watershed protection, monitoring, treatment, laboratory analysis, and then also system maintenance as just kind of shown in this image. This was the, the um, image with the snow that was, I think, three years ago. I think it was about 27 degrees out. We work 24-7. Um, and if there's a broken main, no matter what time of day or night it is, we're going to be out there repairing it. Um, and that also includes, you know, cleaning above ground storage tanks, um, below storage tanks as well too. And this is really to, um, you know, provide adequate pressure for your tap and fire protection and fire response. And the next image, there's no audio, so don't worry, you're not going to hear anything, but it's really just showing us doing a, a repair of a small main and we have our, our main break shield. And this is showing that majority of the time we can actually make a repair without you having to lose complete pressure and you're still able to use your water but it's actually I'm just demonstration of how um, it's very unlikely for contaminants to get into our system even if there is a break because the water is being pushed out um, so as again a number one a number a number a, another thing um, that we do to provide safe drinking water is to, to maintain that system pressure and so while we deliver the bulk of, of water to you, we also see it as a shared responsibility. So that um, is me just kind of shifting from just our general system to the impacts of lead. And so we see it as shared responsibility, especially when it comes to lead in drinking water. Um, and epidemiologist, Dr. Eric Fangle, uh, he explains it very succinctly when uh, he gave a presentation, I, I just kind of took a note and he's, he says, you know, high blood pressure, heart disease, cholesterol, you know, you can do lifestyle and diet change or even have, you know, uh, prescribed medications. But when it comes to uh, lead poisoning, especially for young children, unfortunately, the damage is permanent, um, which is why we're here today to share some more information about how you can um, take steps to prevent that. So how do you know if your drinking water is safe? And as I mentioned earlier, we treat our water by making adjustments to the pH. Um, basically to make it less corrosive for indoor plumbing. And I'll kind of go into more um, high-risk homes um, that have that potential because the water that we serve does not have elevated levels of lead. Um, and, but despite that, we're one of the first uh, municipalities to voluntarily start up a lead and water testing program, which you may or may not have already participated in. And I'll also share some information about how you can if you have not. And so we send out thousands of kits annually. And if you do have high results, we will contact you and talk to you about ways that we can reduce that level of lead. So home plumbing, where does lead come from? So as I said, we do not serve um, water with elevated levels of lead. What Once water does enter a home, depending on a number of factors, the home plumbing could be contributing to those higher levels of lead. And the homeowner or property manager is responsible for maintaining basically the service line and then the indoor plumbing. So taking a look at indoor plumbing, many people think, okay, it's just an older home, you know, and they'll, they might mistake galvanized plumbing like this image shows um, for iron or for lead pipes. That's more common in Boston, Chicago, kind of East Coast. Um, you can do a magnet test if it sticks to it, then it is iron and it's not lead. Um, luckily, you know, we don't have lead service lines either in our Portland metro area. It's more common that have homes that were built between 1970 and 1985, where there was copper plumbing and lead solder to connect the joints. Legislation, a lot of times is slow, unfortunately, so fixtures like 
in your bathroom and your kitchen. If they're older than two older than 2014, they could have higher levels of lead in the actual brass hardware. So it's really dependent on the age of the home, when it's replumbed. Um, but there's even stories where, you know, I've shared this before, but, you know, a father-in-law had good intentions. He replumbed a couple's home. Unfortunately, he used old lead solder that was laying around. So that's why we recommend that you test your drinking water through our program so that you can really figure out whether or not, um, you know, your drinking water is safe for yourself and your family. So lead reduction, what are the main things that you can reduce it? First and foremost, uh, request a lead test kit and, you know, try to figure out whether your um, home was built between 1970 and 85. And but the main thing is really run your water for 30 seconds or a couple minutes before you use your water. That way you're flushing out any sort of corrosion that's happened um, and you're getting fresh drinking water from our system. And we do recommend really only using cold water and not hot water because hot water can increase corrosion. Sometimes it's more convenient because you want your tea quicker, but we do recommend just using cold water. And then some people, if they don't want to, um, if they have young children or are just gonna be uh, filling up a glass, they'd rather just have a filter. There are end of faucet filters or pitcher style filters. And if you have any questions about that, you can always either contact the Fix It Fair and they'll direct that email to me or I'll have contact information and I can share more about that later or if you have questions today too. Um, also, if you have questions about you know, different colored water, discoloration or pressure, feel free to, uh, to contact me. So as far as ordering a kit, it's easy. You can go to leadline.org, um, fill out that uh, information with just your, your contact information and your address, or um, give them a call. Um, and the bulk of the work is done through the county, and then they send us a list, and we actually get those kits out to you. Um, make sure that you follow the instructions. Um, that way, we're just able to provide like the most accurate results and because we, we really want to protect your health as well, too. Um, so that includes with the instructions, not using water for at least six hours, both indoors and outdoors. And if you're gone for a long weekend, um, it's not representative of your day-to-day -day use. So we would prefer that you just not use water for at least six hours before collecting your actual physical sample that you end, end up mailing us and we analyze. Um, and do just collect from one faucet. Sometimes people collect it from multiple and that just, um, we won't be able to analyze that. Um, but again, any questions, you can either call or email us. And then also, if you know anyone that needs translations into another language, um, you know, let us know and, and we can uh, try and accommodate for that as well too. So purchasing products, I just kind of want to briefly go over some of these, um, just so that you're aware that there are different things on the market. You should look for things that are, are labeled lead free. That means it just has 0.25% lead. That's compared to low lead. Low lead fixtures are before 2014 and they have 8%. And then if you see anything that says no lead, that has no regulatory meaning. Same thing as natural as far as like flavoring and food products. So um, look for low lead free. And then bathtubs and outdoor spigots, those are exempt because they're not considered potable drinking water sources. So those could have higher levels of lead, which is again, a reason to either run the water for a bit before using it. That way you're just getting water from, your, um, from, from the mains and then there's less time for corrosion. I do wanna mention uh, childcare. So we offer free childcare testing um, for uh, state accredited child cares in the Portland area. That's a free program that we have. Make sure if you're contacting us that you do mention that because it is a different uh, test kit than we provide our, our, our other residents. And then if you are concerned about your child's exposure, feel free to get, request a blood level test from your doctor. It is something that typically Multnomah County, they provide pop-up clinics, but currently with COVID, they're not doing that, but they are still doing um, some limited um, family investigations with children that do come back with higher levels of lead. Um, and I believe now it's my turn. That's our contact information and I'm passing it back to Penny. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, if there's any questions for Matt, put them into the chat. <clears throat> we'll either get to them now or at the end. Penny, uh, we do have one question that might be timely to answer. Uh, the question is, I always thought our Portland Sorry, our water was fluoride added in Portland. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
we have slight, like a really low level, just a general background level that's just naturally occurring in our system, but we actually, we don't add it. A lot of municipalities do, um, it is pretty common, but um, the voters have chosen a number of times to, to not include that in the drinking water source. So at, at this time and, and um, historically we don't add fluoride. Good question. Anything else, Wing? <clears throat> okay. I think that's it for now. We ha uh, we'll have some more at the end during the Q&A though. Sounds good. All right, we're gonna switch over to talking about water use and your bill, which is probably stressful, but could, you know, I hope we'll come away with, you'll come away with feeling better about it at the end of this. So um, I'll say it can be exciting. We're gonna launch a poll here and I just love to hear how much water do you think Portlanders use on average in gallons per day? So here are your choices, 25, 46, 1, 102, what do you think? Okay, and we can share results whenever you're ready. All right, we are very evenly split, so at least some of you are right. Um, yeah, it's hard to tell, right, because in some parts of the country, all of these could be true although 25 would be very, very low. So we are actually at 46 gallons per day. And um, that is new, that's our new data as of this year, it just dropped down another two gallons per day, which still seems like a lot. But if you think about um, an average person flushing the toilet, maybe five times a day, that can be between one and seven gallons per flush. And so it really depends on your home. And like this slide says, it depends on the number of residents, um, fixtures, leaks, behavior. So all of those things play into what is kind of normal for your household. So we were talking about gallons per person. If you think about it in a household, which for on our average is a, a little over two people per household, uh, you would be using about 15 units of water per quarterly bill. And we, the units that we use are called CCF, centium cubic feet. And that is a, that's not something that we use in the rest of life. So I would love to convert that to gallons. So one CCF is equal to 748 gallons. So if you're looking at your bill, you can always do the math and just look at your water volume in CCF and multiply that by 748. Or we do have an online ca uh, calculator that does that all for you. So that's nice too. And we can link that in this video afterwards. But if you're, if you're thinking about it on a monthly basis, it's probably more like five CCF, but we wanna even take that lower. So we're gonna talk about ways you can reduce your bill. But that's helpful to know where our water goes in the beginning, right? So how is our water actually being used indoors? So typically most of our use is going to toilets. Um, so even without leaks, toilets are the biggest use of water in our home at 24%, followed by showers, make sure I get this right because it recently changed. Yeah, so I usually combine showers and baths because it's just that there are less baths being taken than showers overall. And then if you think about probably the next one is faucets at 19%, clothes washers 17%, and then leaks are a staggering 12% of our water. So we really want to get that down because we don't even get to use that water. However, dishwashers, go ahead and use them. They're very efficient for the most part and use only about 1% of our overall water. So let's talk about toilets because I just said they were the largest use of water in our home. Um, with toilets, age really does matter. So if you have a toilet that is older than 1992, it is most likely going to be over 1.6 gallons per flush. And if it's a toilet from the 50s, it's probably going to be about seven gallons per flush. And then, you know, anywhere in between that range. So we want to get those older toilets out and we have a rebate to help. So it's, it's a $50 rebate unless you're enrolled in our financial assistance program, our bill discount, then it would be a $100 rebate. The other thing is that uh, toilets leak a lot. So we always wanna check for leaks and you can do that by just putting a dye tablet, we give these away in the toilet tank or 10 drops of food coloring, let it sit, don't flush it, come back 10, 15 minutes later. And if you have color that's come into the bowl, you have a leak. So your flapper is leaking or something's happening that's allowing water to go from the tank to the toilet. And people think that's not really a big deal, but it 
it can be um, a huge deal for people. And over time, that really adds up on a bill. So we want to get it taken care of. Just think, thinking about toilets even without leaks, when you replace and put in a more water efficient version, so this water sense version is a 1.28 or better gallons per flush. And that's gonna be about a quarter of the cost per year in sewer and water charges than a five gallon per flush um, toilet from maybe you know the 70s or something like that. So really wanna get those out and um, let's help you do that. You can apply online, it's pretty easy. You just need to have the receipts and you need to have the old toilet recycled, which is about a $7 fee. And I am happy to answer any questions about that too. Um, so this is just a slide about that. You wanna look for that water sense label. They're super easy to find. If you walk into basically any hardware store, any plumbing store, they're gonna have water sense labeled toilets. And um, yeah, that's the kind you want. Next, we're gonna talk about how you can use your water meter to find a leak. So we talked about leaks being 12% of our overall water use indoors. So um, sometimes you don't even know you have a leak and your water meter can help with that if you're in a single family home. If you're in an apartment where you have a shared meter, this is gonna be harder to do. You have to do like the toilet tests and look around your home, uh, maybe check with your management, uh, but you're not gonna be able to directly access your meter or it wouldn't be just feeding your home if that makes sense. But if you're in a single family home, you can go out towards the curb and start looking around for the meter box, which will usually have a metal plate on top, has a W or says water, something like that. And you can just use like a flathead screwdriver, pop that top off, remove it carefully. And then inside you'll see the meter face and I'll go to the next slide so you can see what that looks like. So this is what you're gonna be looking at when you flip the little top of the meter. And they look a little different depending on what type of meter you have, but what you're really looking for is this leak detection dial. And that's what gonna be what's spinning if you have a leak or if you're using a small amount of water. So what you do is tell everybody in the home, don't use water for like 10 minutes, I'm gonna go outside and check my meter. So you know everything's shut off and then you go out and if that little leak detection dial is spinning, you have a leak somewhere and that's gonna be your first indication and then you can start working backwards trying to figure out where that is. Sometimes it'll look like a little snowflake or a different color triangle, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us again and we can help figure out, or you can always take a picture and email that in. We'll help, help you figure out where the leak detection dial is. And let's talk about bill. So your bill, uh, you know a lot about your bill already. I'm assuming if you get a city of Portland bill, but um, some of the things you might not have paid attention to are days of service. So this number three, this is the time in between the two reads. So we read about every three months, but it varies. So sometimes you'll have a much longer period by like two weeks, which could make a difference on your bill or a shorter period. So that's one thing to look for. And your usage. We talked about um, that unit CCF, which doesn't make sense, right? Outside of the water world. So we want to take that water usage and multiply it by 748 to get gallons. And then if we wanted gallons per day, we would divide that number by the days of service. And that's gonna get our, our gallons per day. And then we could know, are we above that 46 average? Are we below it? Are we super efficient? So that's kind of a fun activity to figure out where you fall within um, you know, what's normal for Portland. I do wanna point out that there's a sewer volume and it's different than the water volume on this bill. And the reason for that is that we measure your sewer volume during the winter months, when we assume that the water that you use in your home is staying in your home and going down the drain into the sewer system, therefore, you know, it's needing to be cleaned, you sh you're charged for that volume. But in the summertime, you're probably watering or you might be watering a garden or filling up a kid's pool or, you know, whatever, <laughs> water balloons, etc. That water is not water that you're getting charged for, you know, if it's above what you typically use in the winter time because it's not going down the drain, right? It's not going into the sewer system. It's just going out into your, to your uh, outdoor area. So if one, I guess one other note on that is if you are super efficient now during this time, um, this is gonna affect your sewer volume for the rest of the year. 
So it is a period between usually November and April that, that we're taking that average. And you can always call customer service and find out when your time is. But if you're really good during that time, one, you can keep doing that for the rest of the year, but two, that's gonna lock in that volume for the rest of the year. So that is, can be helpful to know. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about build discount in a little, in just a few slides, but um, I will mention that this 2963 is a discount that you can get on your bill and it stays on once you've applied and been accepted, it stays on for as long as that program's in place. And that is for managing the water that falls on your property, say on your roof or in other areas and keeping it on your property. So if you have like disconnected downspouts from your roof, or if you have large trees on your property that are soaking up water, you can get either a partial or a full discount on that um, on-site stormwater charge. So that you can apply for that online as well. This slide goes into a lot of different services. Some are income-based and some are open to all account holders and even people without accounts. For example, conservation devices are open to everyone within the city of Portland. You don't need to have a water account to do that. Um, also, like Matt was talking about with like lead, lead and water testing, you don't have to have a water account to test for lead. Um, but with income-based programs, the bill discount can be a huge deal. It can take off up to 270 some dollars off of the quarterly bill. And I'll get to the income slide in here in just a minute. Um, but if you qualify for that program you, and you're a homeowner, you can also get free leak and fixture repair. So basically we can send a plumber out for free to fix your leaks if you're enrolled in that program. Another benefit is that you have access to a crisis voucher. So up to $500 per calendar, or excuse me, per year, per 12 months. Um, if you have like a big leak or just like something happened and you just need help with a, a large bill, up to $500 of that can just be um, taken off by that crisis voucher. And then, you know, just for everybody, payment arrangements always, always available. If you just need to, you know, pay 20, $20 this month and then figure out how you're going to spread the rest of it out, that's, that's totally fine. Call our customer service and they're gonna help make a plan with you. We do leak adjustments. So if you happen to find a leak and then have had a large bill, we can, if you, you call us and tell us or email us that you have fixed the leak, we can then adjust back to what would be a more normal bill for you. It's not the entire um, credit back, but it can be a big chunk of it. So definitely do that if you end up fixing a leak. And then we'll talk a little bit more about conservation devices and assistance later on. So a lot of people think they might, might not qualify for a financial assistance program, but take a look at the income ranges or if you know someone who might qualify, this is your maximum monthly income to be able to qualify for this program. If you make less than this and um, there's another bracket basically, you can get even more of a discount, um, but this is typically the, the like entry point into the program. And then I mentioned free water leak repair. So I'll just show you a few of the things that we can fix. So toilets, faucets, showers, pipes, et cetera. It has to be the clean water coming into your home. Um, our funding doesn't allow us to fix sewer or like drain clogs. So that's a bummer right now, but um, yeah, we are able to fix like leaking toilets and replace them and other even service line pipes. So the pipe coming from the meter all the way into your home. We give out free conservation devices. So um, shower heads, faucet aerators, those shower timers can be popular with kids and leak detection tablets. Also the little blue device up in the corner is a um, fill cycle diverter. So it saves about a half gallon per flush within a toilet. And I have a fun video that you can always Google fill cycle diverter, Portland Water Bureau, and we'll show you how to install it or give us a call. And I think that's about it. So I'd love to open it up for questions and also just say, um, you know, you're welcome to contact me directly through this number. So the number on the screen is 503-865-6415. That's my direct cell or conserve at portlandoregon.gov. 
customer service 503-823-7770 or port, uh, PWB customer service at portlandoregon.gov. And just contact us with any of these questions and co customer service does a great job of routing things to the right person. So we'll open it up for any questions you might have. Thanks for being here. Hey, Penny, thank you so much. This is Wing with the Fix It Fair. Um, I'll also let folks know that uh, wherever this video recording is posted will be information about how to contact Fix It Fair. If you have questions, we can relay that to the Water Bureau. Um, but once this gets uh, uh, loaded to our resource library, there'll be a lot of um, links through to the Water Bureau as well. Um, so we do have one question. The question is, I'm interested in doing a community a townhome property effort in water conservation. Have you ever done contests or interactive things like that? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so it sounds like you want to um, help the people within a certain community save water and kind of make it a fun uh, game-like thing. Um, I personally, let's see, I think we have done things like this with kids, but adults are also <laughs> really good at contests. So I haven't personally run one, but I know a lot of utilities have done things like this. The main thing is figuring out how you're gonna track it. Um, we do have these like bags that can help you measure a baseline. So I don't know how nerdy you wanna get with people, but we could always send you out the devices or you could, um, so I'm, I'm thinking like, you have to figure out how to measure it, right? So that people can, maybe it's time for showers, you know, or maybe it's um, thinking about, I mean, you just have to think about, because everybody's fixtures are different. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to measure and be able to keep track. Um, I would love to brainstorm with you offline too, if you want to email me. So conserve at portlandoregon.gov, we could come up with some ideas, but I'd be happy to provide the incentives for people. Like maybe if they do this challenge, they get the free devices from you at the end. I'd be happy to work with you on that. But yeah, we'll just have to figure out how to measure it. And in a townhome, that could be a little tricky if the meters are, are connected, but I think we can be creative about it. And there are devices, if you want to get really into it, that you can actually put on interior pipes and they can measure your water use at that source. So um, there are a lot of options and we can talk. <laughs>